Hey everybody, welcome back to another How to Succeed podcast. This is How to Succeed at Leveraging Your Champions with John Rosso, longtime Sandler trainer from Charleston, and he's also a David A. Sandler award winner. He's the author of Prospect the Sandler Way and all kinds of good stuff. We're going to talk about how do you leverage those internal champions. You know them uh, as your friends in the buying department that can help you shepherd this deal uh, to the end. And uh, this podcast, as always, is brought to you by Sandler, the worldwide leader in sales management and customer service training. For more information on Sandler, go to Sandler.com. There's a ton of free insights. We always have cool events and webinars going on. You can check it out for free. Tip your toe in the water, take a little sample, learn something that might help grow your business. And as always, don't forget to subscribe, share this episode with somebody that you think needs to hear it. Here we go. How to succeed at leveraging your champions with John Rosso. Let's start with uh, the easy question here, John. Uh, why is leveraging champions important and what are we talking about here today? In any kind of even slightly complex sale, it, it, it seems almost impossible. It's not to be able to shepherd that deal across the finish line without a champion when you've got multiple stakeholders in the decision process. And again, according to people like Gartner, it's becoming more and more like 14 in an enterprise sale all of which uh, have their own set of personal pains or personal motivations. And without somebody on the inside to help you shepherd that across and through the organization, odds are you're in trouble. And again, there's all kinds of studies by Salesforce and inside sales about uh, 61% more likely to close with a a champion, uh, 18% faster close with champion, Uh, And uh, so it's crucial. And I think one of the things I want to point out early is is I think there's a difference between a coach and a champion. So a coach, I mean, a coach wants you to win, but a coach may not be willing to invest her political capital on your behalf. He may give you inside information. A champion not only is your coach, but will invest his or her political capital on your behalf to advance a cause. So all champions typically are coaches, but not all coaches are champions. And we salespeople make that mistake a lot thinking we've got someone who's kind towards us, who is interested in working with us, but that's not the same as taking action. I love that. It's a great attitude to start with. And I always start too with the the myths or misconceptions, what we see people do wrong and the first one that comes to mind here for me is pretty easy. We say, hey, you're a champion. Here's my deal. Go sell it for me. And we toss it over the wall. We let them do the pitch. We give them all the materials and stuff. And we say, you know, good luck with my deal. <laughs> and, and maybe kind of follow up with them. Are there any other like tactics or attitudes we should avoid here to start? Well, I think I think that's a huge one to avoid. I think uh, one of the things... One of the techniques sometimes we'll talk about is something called pre-proposal or preposal. And preposal is when I have, in the Sandler words, an upfront contract, an agreement with you, Mike, as my champion to say, hey, I know we need to talk to the larger committee at some point. Why don't you and I schedule some time to sit down? Let me sort of take you through the recommendation, get feedback from you, Mike, share if I'm hitting the mark, missing the mark, you know, who, who will this resonate with? Will it miss with anyone? And one of the things I know for sure, Mike, if this doesn't resonate with you, it probably doesn't even make it to the committee. So your feedback is important. Now, again, out of role play, I've certainly empowered you, right? If your feedback, I mean, if your feedback's not positive, it probably doesn't even make it to the committee. Uh, So I think understanding, I think from an attitude perspective, um, A, believing that, I love the Sandler's attitude that said, I'm financially independent and I don't need the business. I've sort of amended that to I'm I'm financially independent. I don't need the business, but I absolutely want the business if I know it's right for the client and it's right for my organization. And I'm not an arrogant SOB. And so how would I say things if I was financially independent, didn't need the business, knew it was right for the client, knew it was right for my organization, and I'm not an arrogant SOB, what would I say, right? That that is the attitude that programs these longer-term discussions. That's good. And I, I guess I have some other questions up, up front, but feel free to take it in any direction you want here. My my second thought is somebody that is trying to get an internal champion uh, is how do you, you find them? Are these coming from the initial conversation and the referral or introduction? 
you know, past clients, or if we have no connection to a company, how do we know who likes us and who doesn't and who who's going to be our champion? Again, it could come from a couple of places. Just because you've got an introduction or a referral doesn't mean that person will be your champion. Again, in as we look at pain, uh, which in, in my Sandler world would describe it as some compelling personal motivational reason that would commit someone to make a change or take action. And, and it's really a combination of not just understanding the issues and getting specific examples of those issues, but understanding both the organizational as well as personal impacts. Because people, again, people buy for their reasons, not yours. So, so even though I was introduced to you, you may become a champion of mine, and, or you may not. Uh, you may you you may be a great coach, but not have the authority, if you will, or the influence to become a champion. You might need to get me to an executive sponsor or someone who's got a little bit more uh, skin in that game to be able to be able to do that. And one of the ways I can find that out, one of the one of the techniques we'll talk about is passing the baton of power, which I, I see very few salespeople do this effectively. And it's one of the ways to figure out, are you a coach or a champion? And so what it sounds like is this, again, in role play, uh, Mike, you were certainly clear that this will go to the technology committee and ultimately uh, your boss's boss owns that budget. Now they've given you a task to do the due diligence, evaluate options. And I've appreciated the time you've invested with us and your team. So it means a lot. Question for you, if we put that technology committee aside for a moment, and of course, only for a moment, if this decision were yours alone, and again, I know that's not the case, what would you do? I mean, would you say, hey, listen, I've I've got enough out of our relationship that my recommendation would be I'd be working with you. You'd have a PO, we'd assign the team, we'd put a rollout plan. What would you do? Out of role play, anything other than an unequivocal yes tends to be a no. Right? If they go, well, it's a good question. I don't know. I mean, I'd certainly have to evaluate more options. That's not yes, right? You're certainly not a champion yet. So one of the great ways to sort of figure out, are you a coach or a champion is to pass the baton of power. And once, once you say, dude, if it was up to me, I would absolutely go with you. Um, I tell folks, well, hang back. Uh, don't be so willing to jump in. My next question might be, like, tell me why. And you'll start to tell me why you recommend this. The reason why I ask that is I'm beginning to understand your point of view and what you're going to say to the others in the organization, right? So I want to be able to find that because ultimately I may need to rehearse you as we talked about pre-proposal and all those sorts of things. So I want to make sure uh, within that landscape, right, we've all heard the words, uh, this is, I, I always think about three axes, how much influence, how much authority, and how much advocacy. For you to be a champion, advocacy, your advocacy score needs to be super high. And then have to evaluate where are you on the planes of authority and influence as well. Uh, yeah, I think you hit on some really great stuff there. And I have one more setup question before we get into the behavior bucket. And you've already given us some some great techniques too. But since I have a Sandler legend on the, the line today, John, I'm going to hit you with the hard stuff. Um, you know, old school Sandler stuff was really like, he used to to beat up that like if there's an RFP process and you didn't already have a champion, you didn't write the RFP, you don't get the deal. Like you might as well just hang it up uh, and and try for another opportunity. I'm wondering, and you know, with the the deal and the setup itself in today's like complex buyer journeys and more and more people involved, do you feel like that's still true? And again, like what if we don't have one? Do do we need to roll this back? Do we disqualify? Like, I, I love what you said about finding their personal impact. I think if you ask everybody you're talking to, like what's in it for them, you're looking at like who has the most to gain and who can, who, who you can make look good in this process to be your champion. Um, but any other suggestions if, if we feel like we're just lost on who this person is? Yeah. I, well, I think a couple of things. One is, is uh, just disqualify it. If you receive an RFP, uh, out of hand probably is a mistake. Uh, now, again, I look at an RFP and teach folks who are looking at RFPs as it's an invitation for a series of conversations. If they won't give you the conversations, you probably ought to disqualify it. 
listen, it's on paper. You know what to do. Respond or not respond. You choose. Well, probably not respond. In fact, you probably at that point should send a letter to that copies the highest people of the organization that literally says, I've chosen not to respond for a lot of different reasons. One uh, is, is not really understanding specifically what you're going to achieve, why you're looking to achieve that, or what the good definition of a win could be. To me, it would feel like I'm practicing sales mal- malpractice just to throw something against the wall and hope it sticks. I'd rather bow out. So, so oftentimes when you pull away, they may say, all right, well, what do you want to do? We'll set up a time to talk. But in those conversations is where you can begin to determine, can you uh, grow? Can you foster a champion at some levels? So I wouldn't disqualify out of hand, but if they don't let me have the conversations, and the reason why I need the conversations is I want to do the best thing for you. Mike. I don't, mm-hmm. you know, in fact, I'll use, I, I've used words, Mike, I don't want to be ignorant or arrogant, right? I mean, if, if I pretend to know exactly what you're looking for without having that conversation, I'm arrogant. Um, if I just don't ask, well, then I'm ignorant. So those are the things that, uh, that uh, do from an RFP standpoint. I like that. Now, as we move to the behavior bucket, a couple of things come to mind for me, but I was wondering about if you could kind of either walk us through maybe an enterprise sales process or, or the Sandler submarine and tell me where you think the champions are, are important. So we do the right thing at the right time. I, we've already discussed, you know, we want to have that pre-proposal meeting before we get there and, and in pain discoveries, those are great. They can give you insights into other people in the buying committees and stuff. Are there any other times during the sales process that you think champions are important? I, I think throughout the sales process, and in many cases, you're going to meet with different groups of, uh, of stakeholders throughout the organization. Uh, one of the best ways to do that is if you're meet, let's say you don't have your champion in that specific meeting, and now you're meeting with the operations group or you name it, I can get a chance to, these are not the best words, but triangulate the truth there. Uh, hey, uh, had a meeting with the, the operations team. Uh, wanted to share with you a little bit about what I've heard and make sure I get it right and get your feedback on this, Mike. Right. So throughout the process, I've got a chance to uh, to uh, triangulate the truth. I've had folks just recently win a major, major deal uh, with a major, major company where where during the committee meeting, which he attempted to get invited to, but was not invited to. We can talk about that, too. Um his champions texting him during the meeting, hey, here's a question that came up. You know, any 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 thoughts on best way to handle it? So you've really got someone in your corner. And this was a brand new service line in a consulting company. And the odds of it going through where they had no references, they had not done this before. They not have a champion. They have zero chance of winning. I like that. And that was where I was going to go next. If we zoom in on sort of the, the fulfillment here, you, you've already talked about the before. Do you want to talk about the during and after uh, of how we leverage our champion? Sure. So, so again, I like to name things. Uh, I'm not saying I named them, but I like things with names. Passing the baton of power is a name. Uh, this one is called We Both Have a Role. And, and I like this because far too many people leverage their champion incorrectly by saying something that's close-ended, such as this. Mike, do you think it might be possible for me to have a chance to meet with the committee? And and that's a yes or no question. Uh, Not many non-decision makers, it could be champions, could be slightly risk-averse. And so they say something like, and your listeners will probably uh, agree with what I'm saying, that, yeah, I've heard this before. the, the, The champion finds himself or herself saying, um, yeah, I think we can probably make that happen. You know what? Let me talk with them first. And then we don't necessarily get to the committee. The technique is called, we both have a role. And so what it would sound like is this, uh, Ms. Champion, can I make a suggestion? Sure, John, of course. I'll share with you typically what I find to be most effective at this point in the process. And if you can help me figure out the best way to coordinate. Yeah, John, what's that? At this point in the process, the most effective thing is both you and I have a chance to sit down with committee with that committee because in that meeting, we both have a role. Certainly your role as the insider is the one who understands sort of the unique requirements, what you've been tasked to do, the options you've considered, how you're working today. I can't do that, only you can. Me, 
as the potential partner, I'm the only one that can talk through staffing, scope, timing, pricing, terms. In that meeting, we both have a role, Mike. What's the best way to get this thing set up? So leveraging your champion to be able to move up and through the organization uh, by tapping into what I would call social proof, typically what happens in this situation. It's a great technique that's, again, nothing's perfect, but it's more effective than saying, would it be possible potentially for me to have a chance to meet with so-and-so? Yeah. Now, yeah. I want to ask you about specifically during that meeting with the committee, because in large deals that I've lost, it's been incredibly frustrating to hear from your champion afterwards, like, oh, well, that didn't go well, or so-and-so had more power than I thought, or other things, like maybe we leaned on somebody that nobody else liked, and we didn't realize yeah. that, and just other things can go wrong sometimes when you're trying to work through a champion. And I, I'm wondering if there's anything or advice you have on how much we leverage them during that committee meeting and how we do that with. Yeah. You know, uh, I, I think a couple, a couple different ways. One is, is most people in committee meetings for lack of a better word, fit in the same place. So often I can draw myself a conference room table and say, talk to me about who's on the committee help me understand their role. I don't necessarily use the words, what's their influence, what's their authority, but I want to find out where they sit. I want to find my champion's sense as to what's the most important criteria or personal win for the people in the room. And then ask if you were me, you know, you've got six people here. If you had to pick three that you think would have uh, a major influence in this, who do you think they would be? Oh, absolutely. It would be A, B, and C. And then what I ask that champion to do is coordinate a short meeting pre-committee with A, B, and C. And so what it sounds like is, again, Mike, here's what I found to be helpful is, is let's set up, work with me to set up a 15, 20 minute meeting with Ms. A, Ms. B, Mr. C for, for these reasons. Uh, one of the things I want to do is make sure that we structure that meeting to make sure they get what they want out of that meeting. A short conversation to understand expectations can be a big help. What's the best way to coordinate that? Now, Mike, what I have there is my competitors haven't done that. Likely, right? right now. Not now. Not only do I get bonding, right? Because now I've talked to these folks, but I understand their personal motivators, their key criteria. One of my favorite questions to ask in competitive situations is is something like this. Um, so, Mike, let me ask you this: uh, Assuming for a moment that you had three qualified alternatives, hypothetically, if we put price aside just for a minute, what criteria would you use to decide among? seemingly qualified alternatives, and you get really good answers. So not only have you bonded with them, but you've gotten a little bit closer to the motivating reasons that they care. And so, so that's pre-committee meeting. In the committee meeting, um, especially if that champion was the one charted to do some of the due diligence, right? I've shared my upfront contract, again, sort of my agenda squared, how I'm going to set the expectations for that meeting. And then, and then early on, Here's what it'll sound like. I'll, I'll do the role play again. Mm -hmm. uh, what I think might make sense is, is, Mike, I know you and your team spent a lot of time with our team sort of thinking through uh, your requirements and what would make this a win for your organization. It may make sense for us to spend a minute or two to sort of recap that, to make sure that we're all on the same page and we can talk around the room if anything's changed. Uh, and then what I'd like to be able to do is go around the room and ask each of you today two questions before we get started to help this make to help make this as effective for you as possible. One is, um, if there was one single thing you wanted to make sure you and your team got out of this implementation, what would it be? And my second question is, um, in choosing a supplier, right, and choosing a partner to go through this with you, um, in your view, what would be the single most important criteria? Now I have a chance to go around that room and, and none of your competitors are doing this. I've seen people go from last place, third, unrecognized to winning in a competitive RFP situation where almost always the feedback has been, you know, uh, we weren't expecting to go in this direction, but we really came away with as a team that you understood us a lot better than anybody else. And you can use that champion at the beginning to sort of start that process and then radiate out across the rest of the room. I love that. I'll give you one more shot here, just as like anything that we missed. I do have a few more questions for you, but yeah, sure. uh, open it up here. Uh, before we close this out, any other 
uh, behaviors you think we should be aware of or, or techniques, tips, and hacks you wanted to share on this topic? Yeah, let me, yeah, a few. Let me give you a behavior, but it's a, it's a very broad sense. One of the things uh, that I teach and try to live, I should live it better, is find a way to do things that are significant, personal, and unexpected, right? Mm -hmm. I, think, I think that's the way to really build deeper relationships. And, and that's one of the reasons why it was worthwhile to talk to those pre those committee members pre, because again, I get a chance to find out that your son is in a soccer tournament in Orlando because he plays high level national soccer, whatever. And if I can find ways to do things that are significant, personal, and unexpected, you can really build deep rooted relationships. And I want to, I want to be able to work with my champion and nurture that relationship uh, from a technique point of view. Uh, I'll give you two others. And, and then if, if you've got some other questions, one, if, if, if my champion happens to be the executive sponsor, let's call it the decision maker, but the decision maker feels she needs buy-in, which is okay. Um, one, of the, one of the techniques we have is called grappling hook. Grappling hook means I may need you again because perhaps they've said, what I want your team to do is work with our team and find a way to figure this thing out together. Um, but I'm, I'm in your camp. Grappling hook sounds like this. Uh, Mike, I appreciate that. It means a lot. Super excited to get our team working with your team. And I don't know that I see this happening, but it's happened in the past where for whatever reason, things get caught in the mud, slow down, uh, get stuck in a log jam. I may need to come back to you, Mike, if that happens to say, hey, I need a little bit of help. We just seem to be stuck in a rut um, and I'll need you to break that log jam. Uh, you comfortable if that happens? And now I get an agreement that A, they can't keep me away from you, the decision maker, and I've got a grappling hook back up in. Uh, that's, a, that's a really good technique. One last technique that, that if you're selling a large deal to a large company, uh, we've named this bureaucratic nightmare. I've had situations where the salesperson and the sales team has worked with the champion and the champion's team and put together elegant multi-million dollar solutions only to find that recommendation thrown over the procurement trans transom, then get bid out and find out that they lost that deal. Uh, and that's a heartbreaker because you might have spent eight months working on this. It's a heartbreaker for your champion, for the, for, the, for the client, for the selling organization. So we've instituted something called bureaucratic nightmare, and it kind of sounds like this. Mike, I know that you and I worked tremendously hard, you and your and our teams, to put together what we feel is the best recommendation for your organization to achieve ABCDEFG. Um, again, I don't know that I see this happening, but in organizations this size, uh, sometimes once we make those recommendations, they can get thrown over the transom into a larger procurement program where it gets stripped away, rebid, and then all of a sudden you're surprised that you're not getting so the solution you want because that's us. And we don't get that solution. And we're sort of caught in this bureaucratic nightmare. Can we think through that for a moment? Is there some way, Mike, we can avoid that happening? So bringing that up, right? Uh, Sailor had an old rule, rule that if there's a bomb in the road, we want to defuse it before it blows. And, mm -hmm. and I've seen that uh, save some very, very large deals. I love that. You did cover one of my questions there, which is like, how do we pull them back in and, and what happens afterwards? So I love the grappling hook there. And certainly the bureaucratic nightmare is uh, mm -hmm. something you want to avoid as well. My last question for you, and I don't know, I feel like I've been in a negative mood today, but I, I'm playing because you're such a good good cop. I'm playing the bad cop here. Oh. Um Obviously, we've been talking about leveraging our champions. What about what do we do with detractors? Ah, yeah. Oh, great, great questions. So, 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 uh, a detractor can do a couple things, right? So, if the detractor is the decision maker, right? Um, we, we, we've got it. So, there's a couple of things. If the detractor is the decision maker, don't be afraid, if you will, to say in role play, of course. Mike, let me ask you this. Uh, with all indications, James seems to be against moving forward with us on this. My sense is that means it's over. Or am I wrong? Right. And then I, I mean, that cuts to the chase on the truth to see what he or she, in this case, what Mike is going to say. I tell you what, if you can't get Jane on your side, it's over. Now I got nothing to lose. You can't lose what you don't have. Others, they say, no, that's not the case. Jane, it's Jane's checkbook. But listen, you've got Mr. A, Ms. B, Ms. C 
who really has the influence in this decision. I want to be able to, I want to be able to understand that. Right. So that's one of them Two, If I have a detractor in my committee meeting, um, there's a, there's an old Sandler uh, tactic called let you and him fight. Right. So, <laughs> so I go around the room and, and I, and I start with my champion. I say, Mike, this is the end of the meeting, right? Mike, let me ask you this on a scale of one to 10, where one is you've been polite. And I don't think this is the case at all. You've been polite, but where you've written off us as a potential partner, um, you just set through because you're a nice guy. 10 said, in your mind, we're the right partner. It's really just a matter of working out the terms and conditions and the rollout schedule. Where are you? Uh, honestly, I'm a, I'm a nine, right? And, and we have a chance to go around the room. Somebody says, I'm probably a three right? Mm. Let's not panic. No need to defend, justify, and explain too soon. Let you and him fight. What it sounds like is this. Uh, first of all, I appreciate the candor, Mike. Uh, tell us a little bit about why. Uh, I don't think you're scalable enough. I don't think you've got the references for this, whatever they say. Now I back up and I say, you know, Bob's raised some decent points here. Mike, thoughts on this? And I get a, a cross conversation among all those committee meetings because I'm hearing everything I'm going to hear when I leave the room. Right. And we've got a chance to sort of work on that detractor by A, being respected. I mean, we're, we're, we're being respectful, but I get a chance to hear all the crosstalk and I can chime in when appropriate. Uh, I love that. I think that's really good and something that most of the people listening today haven't heard before. I was also just going to circle back and plus one your idea of what you did with the uh, champions, which is you got to make it personal, make it relevant and and do something to surprise them or impact them in the way and, and love up those detractors as much as you do your champions and, and find a way to connect with them. Right. But I'm yeah, assuming that you can, obviously right. you're going to try and do that anyway. Right. Well, yeah, and and we'll we'll call it fingerprinting, right? If if you've got a detractor, one of the ways you can help bring that detractor in—it's not a guarantee it's going to work—is uh, again, Mike. This is an important initiative. Your key part would be uh, is crucial. Uh, let's get your fingerprints on this. Let's figure out what's going to work, because again, I've got to be able to bring you in. Otherwise, I've got someone you know on the side with a shooting spitballs at me, and and yeah. It can, it can cause trouble. I've got to I've got to be able to build some consensus. And consensus doesn't mean everybody agrees on everything. It just means in the end, we agree and then we'll move forward. So I'm looking to develop consensus. Headed up by my champion. I love it. John Rosso, longtime Sandler trainer from Charleston. Shout out to our enterprise team. If you got multi-location, multi-language, big teams. Uh, we help you there as well. Uh, free resources uh, like this at sandler.com. Click on the insights tab and get yourself started. And don't forget to share this episode with somebody that you think needs to hear it. Thanks for making it all the way to the end. You're a rock star. Whatever you are, be a good one. We'll see you next time. Bye, everybody.